remember President Obama telling us, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your health care insurance, you can keep your insurance. How's that working out for you now that we're several years into health care, the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, and also health care transformation here in Oregon? How do we trust government when promises like that are made and we know they really weren't intended to be kept? I'm very happy to welcome you to People, Places, and Politics. I'm Patty Milne, and my guest today is Dr. Mark Anderson. Mark has yeah. just uh, officially, you are now Dr. Anderson. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And we visited uh, two weeks ago on my program talking about health care transformation, where we are today. You and I have been discussing this for a long time, and you've done a tremendous amount of research. It's time now to bring people uh, back up to speed as far as what has been happening. And of course, the legislature here, right here in Salem, has just taken action on uh, moving um, what was the um, uh, health care, all the health care stuff, to the business and consumers um, department. Um, that's, that's a discussion for another day. We talked about many, many things um, in our last program. There are a couple of things I want to revisit just very, very briefly. So um, to just kind of lay the foundation for our um, viewers. And then also, uh, as I thought about what we had talked about the last time, I'd like to move forward now. There are some really, really critical aspects of health care that are coming forward that some people had shown uh, concern about, um, others boo-hooed it. And that is the issue of mental health and the role it's mm -hmm. playing. We touched a bit on that last time. And then also the school-based health centers. But again, I want, um, I want to let the audience know Mark, um, Dr. Mark Anderson, best known, perhaps best known, um, as the host of I Spy Radio. So yeah. thank you for coming to continue this discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, just so people are aware, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a doctor <laughs> of business administration, which means that I'm the kind of the bean counter, so to speak, looking at uh, how healthcare is run from an economic standpoint and also from an organizational standpoint, especially in terms of how uh, the whole, uh, really when you look at what has happened with the Affordable Care Act, with, uh, with Oregon's own version of that, uh, we have totally transformed how, how health care is being administered. And so now it is really upsetting the relationship between you and your doctor. It, and I like to call it now uh, medical care through, uh, at, uh, through Russian nesting dolls because that's essentially what we've set up. Yeah. There's all these layers of bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, see, w when I was a kid, uh, we went to Dr. Goldstein. He was our family doctor. And uh, he saw all of us, saw my parents, saw all of us kids, all five of us. And so when there was an issue, you went to his doctor. He was, your, he was what you're called now, your primary care physician. Back then he was a GP, general practitioner. And that was, that was really it. And then if you needed something, uh, I actually had cancer when I was three and a half years old. And so they had to bring in some oncologists, mm -hmm. some specialists. And uh, so, but, but your, your real main relationship mm -hmm. was with that one doctor. Mm -hmm. And now you've got not just your your own doctor, but you've got layers of bureaucracy between you and your doctor. You'll have healthcare navigators. And if I could, and sure. and you're referring to these individuals who are not medical professionals. That's exactly right. That's and, the big thing. And that's thing. really key to all of this bureaucracy that's been created to separate you from your doctor. That's so correct. Touch on, that, touch on that's, that. That's that. That's very correct. In fact, uh, what's interesting about that too is is that the stated goal of this is to save money. Well, uh, I actually did an analysis <laughs> and, it found, and found out that if you hire somebody, because uh, they were projecting like $45,000 at the time, mm -hmm. and if you, if you look at the long-term effect of that, is that that person is not only going to spend 20, maybe 30 years in the workforce, but then they may likely be on PERS for 20 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So you're actually hiring somebody for 50 years versus somebody that, you know, just a doctor who isn't costing the state any money because uh, he's, he's not working for the state, he's an independent contractor. It's far more expensive to hire just one of these health navigators at the stated rate mm -hmm. than it is simply the, than the long-term cost of, of that doctor, simply because of the impact of PERS. I mean, even if the state just hired a doctor, they'd be better off hiring a doctor versus these health, uh, these navigators simply because if, 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 you, if you did it in such a way that the doctor was not on PERS, because m most doctors will have their own 
uh, their own insurance policies, mm -hmm. their own uh, their, their their own retirement policies, uh, or uh, uh, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to worry about them being on PERS. So and, and the, at least not for the moment. That's right. At least not for the moment. Not for and the moment. and that does make you wonder the way that they have really started pushing CCOs onto people. Where is this all of this headed? And I think that that is my big concern as they look at mm -hmm. uh, the CCO models and what that has meant. Is okay. So let's look at uh, let's let's look down the road in, in terms of what this can mean. And like we said last time, is the real problem is that. Um, you are essentially giving over control of your own body to, to the government. And so whenever you give control of the government, you then become a liability to them, mm -hmm. meaning that mm -hmm. they have a fiduciary responsibility, uh, financial responsibility to the taxpayer to keep costs as low as possible. Just as they do in anything else, um, any other programs they run. And, and therefore, it's the individual who's being served really is not the primary uh, reason to um, stay within the budget. Right. It's, it's I stay in the budget or my neck is on the line. That's right. And as the provider. And, and yeah. so because you have now sacrificed that relationship between yeah. you and your doctor and you've got all of these new levels of, of government, mm -hmm. I mean the cost just there, I mean think about it, can you really hire 12 people <laughs> to, yeah. to, to save money over hiring just one person? No, of course not. Um, but anyway, uh, aside from that, uh, you, by giving over control of your health care to the, to the government, you are really giving over control of everything. To them, and as we said a little, we touched a little bit on last last week, uh, or, or uh, last time, was that uh, uh, you have to be okay with the government deciding all sorts of things in terms of like your mental care, your mental health care. So they may uh, come in and say, well, you know, uh, Patty, you as a Catholic, you're kind of intolerant because you believe what the Bible yeah. says says you should, or you, you know, yeah. you follow what your priests are saying. And so because of the fact that you may not believe in abortion or any number of of social issues that, that might run afoul of, in terms of what the government is saying, uh, they can say, well, you're not very tolerant. Maybe we, you need to seek some mental health counseling for that. And that then opens a huge can of it worms. It does, because who determines what being mentally healthy yeah. means? And so you're, you're jumping right to something that I wanted to be sure to touch on. Um, the Statesman Journal, uh, April 11th, uh, just um, a few days ago, there was a guest opinion written by Dan Gross and Josie Henderson, and uh, there are two things in this article that really jumped out and caught my attention and relates. Uh, uh, it, it, it's so, um, uh, it really exposes more what some of the underlying concerns are and concerns that people have had for some time about the government taking over your health care and why is mental health um, being talked about so much more today than it was just um, a year ago, two years ago, or... or um, I guess we have a lot more crazy people now than we ever did before. Well, apparently there are, yeah. but who is it that is determining m mental illness yeah. and, and to what degree? Um, in and, this... And, and just to interrupt you real go quick, ahead. Is, is that if when you look through the bills that created this, mm -hmm. the amount of funding now that is going towards mental health is growing exponentially. Yes. Yes. And you know what they'll say is, well, we didn't have a lot of funding for it to begin with, but okay, so why do we need that mental health? I mean, it was really being pushed. When you look at, at both the Affordable Care Act and uh, uh, Oregon's own version of accelerated Obamacare, uh, the mental health aspects were, were really being uh, pushed to the forefront in terms of uh, both funding and also ex expansion of services. Well, it, it's part of the discussion, too, where, where liberals really separate groups of people. Mm -hmm. And then instead of um, being concerned about the individuals in the group, it, the group now becomes a special interest and a pawn, if you will, in this discussion. So um, the, the headline that's on this article is Treat Gun Deaths and Injuries as a Public Health issue. Mm -hmm. Of course, the headline really caught my attention. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there are two key um, parts of this um, uh, guest opinion and then there was an article in the paper just today and as we're sitting here it is um, Wednesday April 15th. Um, in this guest opinion they say these two individuals unsafe access to guns in our country is causing a public health epidemic that we urgently need to address and I'm emphasizing their own words. 
we can affect meaningful change by mirroring the same public health approach we used to combat drunken driving. This multi-prong approach includes effective policy, consumer product safety, and promotion of healthy behavior. So think back, now they've mentioned three things. Effective policy, as we're talking about, there's so much more attention in government and also in public safety, but I don't wanna go there just yet. There's much more, as you've just expressed, much more attention to mental health. What is it? And gee, it's causing these crimes, it's causing disruption in the community, and we have to do something about mental health. Well, gosh, it's a part of the larger health care issue, but how does that relate to then who makes the decision what's healthy mental yes, health? Yes. And, and, and that's a very key point because people that are okay with Democrats running health care uh, mm -hmm. and, and Kids Hub running health care, you have to understand that you are also, you also have to be okay if Ted Cruz ran your health care. And I think that that's a key point is because a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of the social democrats and a lot of the, mm -hmm. the well, let's face it, socialists uh, that are pushing a lot of this, I mean, they, they say, well, the government can do a better job of this than, than, than you can. Well, okay, well, so what happens when we get a Ted Cruz in office? So mm -hmm. you, you can't mm -hmm. be okay with just one side doing it. And this is why it's always better if you are in charge of your own health, right. if you are making your own decisions and, rather than the government making the decisions for you, because that's a great point is you are giving over that, that control to somebody so else. So government is going to make a policy that, that now uh, controls the population's behavior as well as your very individual behavior and they are relating it to the problem we have of crimes committed with guns. And of course, yeah. crimes can be committed, committed with a knife, with a fist, um, with a vehicle, with, with all kinds of things, but they're, they're, they're using this. They're using this issue to move the, this gun control. So they, they talk about it's important to expand background checks to cover all gun sales, including those blah, blah, blah. Um, keeping guns out of dangerous hands and saving lives. Yes, I do want to acknowledge there have been horrific crimes committed. Um, and guns have been involved in the crime. Um, I'm, I'm there, well aware of that. There have also been horrific crimes committed with a car. Yes, or recently right here locally with a baseball bat yes. or some kind of a bat. Um, or again, just, just somebody's physical um, strength can do horrible, horrible um, damage to another individual. But what's very key about this article in our discussion is they tell people this is not a political issue, but a critical issue of our public health and safety in Oregon and across the country. So they're preying on, they're using all the buzz, buzzwords and preying on, on average Oregonians, average Americans that um, in order to, to stop crimes, we have to address mental illness and make sure that people who have this mental illness um, are not having access to guns. Well, yeah, these laws are not going to keep people who are mentally ill um, away from being able to, to get a gun. And, and of course, that's another discussion. It, it's an answer in search of a problem. Well, it, it's, it really is. And then, and then in this other article, um, as, as this has passed the two chambers or, or passed the, the Senate, um, there, just real quickly here, and it, this is Senator Prozansky's pet project, um, and he proclaims to be a gun owner himself, and so he's trying to identify with with um, with those voters. But nonetheless, he he says the measure. Uh, well, this is what's really really key in this bill. It includes a provision that would require require judges who order someone to receive outpatient mental care, mental care, I didn't hear the word health in there, mm. mental care, to determine whether the person should also be barred from gun ownership. So a judge can make a determination. Not your doctor. Th correct. Um, on the mental care and should this individual be barred from gun ownership. So now we're mixing, mixing things here. Currently under the law, if a person who has been involuntarily committed to treatment, 
That means the law made them, you have to uh, undergo this treatment. So what Senator Prozansky has put in to this bill is a judge could determine uh, that you really can't own a gun, mm -hmm. and, and that's very different from the current law. Um, the other thing in here that catches my attention is um, it was this uh, concern was raised by uh, Senate Minority Leader Ted Ferrioli, who says it could lead uh, authorities into trying to confiscate guns from people they don't think should have them. And that's key, and that's what you and I are talking about here, is so who determines um, what is appropriate mental care, what's appropriate mental health, when do you need mental care, and of course now it's wrapped into Obamacare, it's wrapped into this um, Oregon effort at health care transformation. Who's going to make this decision? Yeah. Who determines that I'm mentally healthy? Yes. Who determines you are mentally healthy? We're two totally different individuals. What do they use for guidelines? Where are we going with this, wrapping this mental health into um, legislation uh, regarding gun ownership, access to guns, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Well, for liberal policies to work, two things have to happen. They have to ignore, uh, well, actually, it's not they have to happen. They need to ignore two things, one of which is history, the other is reality. And, and the history of gun care, uh, uh, gun control laws, I, I can guarantee you, in fact, I'll let you in on a secret, <laughs> gun control laws don't work because criminals don't obey gun, uh, right. don't, don't right. obey laws. Right. So, and actually one of the earliest gun laws uh, dated back to the uh, 1600s. You know what that mm -hmm. law was about? It was not about uh, who uh, stopping people from having guns per se, but in, in uh, making sure that only the right people had mm -hmm. guns. Mm -hmm. And it was actually all of the Catholics uh, had guns and the Protestants could not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it then switched, mm -hmm. and, and of course obviously this sets up a huge uh, area for abuse right. when you have just one side armed. And uh, so uh, again, ignoring history there and, and also ignoring reality, uh, the reality th is the fact that, that criminals don't obey gun laws. I mean, that is just, that's, they're criminals. I mean, so they, what, th th when has anybody ever yeah. stopped a, 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 a crime in progress, you know, at a, a, a hold up at, a, let's say, a 7-Eleven, when, uh, imagine the cashier saying, wait a minute, we have gun laws. Yeah. Is that going to stop anybody, really? It's not. And, and just as we've both um, indicated previously, there are a lot of weapons. And people who are going to commit crimes are going to commit crimes. And um, that's, that's the, the problem. But, um, but the issue, this just illustrates again um, how, how this health care transformation is not so much about saving money, making sure everyone has health it's care. An yeah. It's an agenda that also goes along with, um, with the education transformation, a lot of changes that are being made in public safety. Um, rather than locking someone up, it wasn't really your fault. It, you know, your mother um, ignored you when, when you, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, we really, really need to be looking at, at all of these issues. What is in the best interest um, to protect freedoms, to protect personal rights, and, and also we can even get into economic development, but that's another story. The, the liberal agenda um, on, on a universal single-payer healthcare system goes back decades, decades and decades, and they have inched and inched and pushed um, various aspects of this all along the way, and then all of a sudden, um, here it is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very open, very clear um, that they want a single payer, that universal health care is, is what they're trying to achieve. What people still, and going back to our, our desire to, to talk about this, is there's really more to the story that people really, really need to be aware of. Yeah. And it's about controlling lives. Yeah, and, and really it's, it's not so much about health care, it's about control. Because that, that, at its heart, is what government is about. It's about control. It's controlling resources. It's controlling people, it's controlling interactions between people, it's about controlling interactions between states and other entities. It's controlling corporations, you know, you have certain guidelines, you have taxes that, that, that shape how you, how you move forward with, with uh, your business plans. I mean, 
it, government doesn't create value. It, 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 it is about control. And I, I think you raise a great point because when it comes down to mental health care, uh, you know, a lot of people might be out there thinking, okay, well, this could never happen. I mean, are they really going to use mental health care to take guns away from people? Yeah, it actually already has happened. That's right, and it's and, right here. Yeah, <laughs> and it's right here. But also, f and, and they also might be thinking, well, is, is it really going to be that bad having the government control things? Well, yes. Uh, in fact, there's a friend of ours uh, that we know um, um, through, through Facebook, actually, is where I first saw this uh, from her, was that she was actually trying to get her health care records for her daughter, who's 12 years old, and she contacted the school in order to do this, and she was told she couldn't get access to mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. 12 years old. And the reason <laughs> being is because this goes back to the health care law, mm -hmm. uh, Oregon's grand transformation, which, uh, which changed the law from FERPA, which is uh, family something something, I don't remember the exact, but anyway, it, it, it had to do with family, access to family health care mm -hmm. records. So that way a, a parent could go in and always make sure they would know what their child was being uh, given at school, uh, be able to control what they're b being given, and, and basically it, it recognized, you know, it followed the, the Supreme Court a ruling time and again that parents are the ultimate responsibility for their children, and they have the ultimate say in, in their child's lives. However, the health care law here in Oregon specifically moved away mm -hmm, from FERPA mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. HIPAA. And this really raises the bar in terms of privacy. And so just like what she has now experienced, this is we're actually seeing this starting to hit, she has now experienced that she can't even go in and get her health records for her own 12-year-old daughter. And so think of the implications on it. that. See, this, yeah. is, this is where yeah. my, my doctorate comes in handy, mm -hmm. is because we're trained to think down the road in terms mm -hmm. of what are the ramifications mm -hmm. of this. What are the natural outgrowths of this? And this is a clear case of when you start setting up these kinds of laws mm -hmm. and you cut off a, a, a parent from their child, now all of a sudden you have a situation, and remember now they're pushing into mental health care, and this this is actually an, another aspect, I mean, it gets us hold down another whole road here, is the school-based health centers. Yes. And yes. this is another huge area that maybe we can come back and talk about in, in more depth, but this is something that Planned Parenthood was very involved in getting in mm -hmm. into all the schools, mm -hmm. and this is being pushed on all these schools under the guise of the CCOs. And the, the, uh, the, the goal of this is to have healthcare workers there at the, at the school but now because they've got HIPAA laws in place rather than FERPA, mm -hmm. you, can put your, you can literally put your daughter on, on the school bus in the morning and not know what in the world happens to her from that point forward. They're, they can get you into, the, if, you, if they have a school-based health center, Planned Parenthood, they're not going to be doing abortions there on school, but they will certainly get you to an abortion clinic. They can certainly make that referral. They, they can get you to yes. a mental health yes. counselor. They can uh -huh. get you to all, all of these other things. that, you, that they, they can put your daughter on, on birth control. And because they, and now, and it's not just the schools, it's not just changing the relationship between you and your doctors and your children, but also between the schools and the parents and the children. Because yes. now yeah. the school is inserting itself in the role of the parent. And the school is saying, well, you know, if you want to get on birth control, that's fine, and we'll protect you. Because the law will say what you can do and what you can't do, and it's not the parent anymore. Well, we know um, right here, in, in Oregon, right here in Marion County, going back to um, a great concern I had as Marion County Commissioner through our health department is at the health department, a child, mm -hmm. 10, 12 year old, um, can go to the health department, and this is true in, in every county health department, can go to the health department and ask for birth control. And the Oregon does not have, um, have a law that says a parent or family member has a right to to know what's going on in that child's life. So th this has been, that part has already been put in place yes. through our, our county health departments where these children, and yes, uh, if you look at the county statistics, some of these children getting, getting birth control, the morning after pill, and advice um, are, are not necessarily 16, 18 year old kids, which that's bad enough, but when we're talking 10-year-old and 12-year-old children mm -hmm. who, who really need a family member to walk them through these adult decision-making yes. processes, yes. and uh, you are totally locked out of your child's life, mm -hmm. and government, county employees in the case I'm referring to, um, have the authority to 
to make decisions on behalf of your child. So that, that has gone totally um, uh, the wrong direction in, in my view of what is, and that gets into mental health issues. It gets into to raising healthy children with, um, who are able to make good decisions about their own life. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just let a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old walk into a county health department and talk to a stranger and I'm not putting down anyone who works at the health department, but these are strangers to these children, and they're giving these children advice and handing out um, medical yeah. prescriptions. Without any understanding of that child's history, without right. any understanding right. of the, the, the morals that are being taught to that child and uh, the ethics that are being taught to that child, or any of the conditions of that home. And Unfortunately, liberals like to take one little problem and blow it up and make mm -hmm. it then effective to everybody. But again, and, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't ten-year-olds that that are are being that are not being abused right, uh, right. by by family mm -hmm. members or by friends or neighbors or something like that. Yes, there are instances when they need to reach out and and they will say, well, there's a lot of times when these these kids can't talk to their parents. But can't but, that be the exception rather than the rule? And that's than, exactly than right rule. because yeah. those are the minor exceptions mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than they've now taken that one little issue and now made a blanket policy that then covers everybody. Right? And and so you, you are changing the dynamics of that situation so that, that the parent can't, uh, in, in fact, you will actually have the school blocking the, the, that parent-child relationship. And so, That's right. it, so if you're trying to raise your, your child in a religious, ethical, uh, moral household and the school counselor maybe has a very different agenda, uh, you know, may, maybe they are very uh, pro-whatever, uh, or pro-sex. I mean, we've, we've certainly seen actually here within, the, within uh, you know, Coin 6 did that great mm -hmm. expose, mm -hmm. as did Ice Blind Radio, mm -hmm. I, I would like to say, <laughs> on, on the Oregon, uh, yeah, the, the Adolescent Sexuality Conference. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, a sex ed kind of conference. Oh, no. It's a sexuality <laughs> conference. Yes. And it's about promoting yes. a certain point of view and, and, and certainly promoting promiscuity and so y you as a parent may not want your child to be anywhere near that because you know well, what they, w w you, know, uh -huh. you, you understand where they are at uh, mentally, developmentally, and, and everything else, and, but you've got a school coming in promoting their own particular viewpoint and pushing that on your children, and you don't have the ability now to stop that. And you may not even know it until it's too late that what, that what your government officials, including teachers, and again, I am not picking on any individual teacher, but the problem is government, and that includes health providers who are employed by the government, it includes teachers who are employed by the government, that this, this um, pulling your child away from your values, what you're trying to teach them, this is happening every single day in, in potentially in the classroom, potentially in all aspects of the child's life, and you may not know it until it's too late. Yes and how did we get here and how did we get to this place and the question I asked at the very beginning how do we trust our government how do we trust our government to to take care of our children when we send them to school every day how do we trust our our children their very lives their health care so we're going to run out of time here in a moment so I, I'll just give you the the last uh, minute here to, or the last couple of seconds to close well, well, and well again it's just if, if you're okay with the government running your life now, it might be that that uh, you might be okay with the government telling people that well they're not very tolerant because of, of you know whatever uh, homosexuality that we used last time. Uh, you also have to then be okay with that same government telling homosexuals that they're not okay. So thank you, Mark, for being my guest again. We'll continue this conversation. All right. <laughs>